affect the glucocorticoid receptor compared to other steroid receptors, the mineral corticoids, the sex hormone receptors. And you can see just on this slide, and I know you not to remember all the numbers, but we have absolutely fantastic selectivity against glucocorticoid receptors. And it means that if we keep them in the lung or in the skin or in the nose and away from blood, then obviously we can have fantastic, um, a, a much better safety profile. My good friend, Peter Barnes, who Vladimir knows well also, of course, summarized as he always does very nicely, that we have two major mechanisms to why glucocorticoids are so effective as anti-inflammatory drugs. Because on the one side, they can activate the genomic system to induce or in the genes that produce some anti-inflammatory um, proteins. They're also very, very good at increasing beta receptors on tissues and remembering that we're giving them with beta receptor agonists very often, this is a good thing. And on the other side, which is sort of the conventional thing that we think about steroids, is that they're also able to inhibit the regulation of producing proteins that are actually involved in the inflammatory process. So all the major cytokines, the adhesion molecules that are involved in the recruitment of inflammatory cells into the lung, and various other enzymes that need to be induced, steroids suppress them. And that is why they are so effective as anti-inflammatory agents. And um, again, we can do diagrams like this. All the things that have been implicated in aspirin and COPD can be blocked by glucocorticoid steroids. But the one thing most of you in this room will not remember or know necessarily, unless there are any dermatologists in the room, is actually how do we find topical steroids? And it was actually an American dermatologist called McKenzie. And he did this very simple experiment, which you probably can't see in this light, but we know if you put steroids onto the skin, within 20 minutes, the skin blanches, it goes white. So this is not genomic because genomic changes take hours, eight, 24 hours. This is a non-genomic effect. And I just show you here with topical budesonide, um, the ability to, to um, cause this local blanching. And what most of you are probably not aware of is if you look at the relative potency of topical steroids, there's anti-inflammatory drugs, and this is a study from Philips a, a few years ago. The potency in this McKenzie test predicts how good they are as anti-inflammatory drugs in the lung, the nose, and the skin. So we've spent an entire 20 or 30 years trying to find better steroids based on genomic activity, when actually the thing that predicts how they work is non-genomic. And I put this to you because I think we now know from a number of, of, of studies that there is this very rapid effect of steroids. And you can see this, one of my colleagues in London measured xenon clearance after inhalation of steroids to show local basic constriction in the lung. This occurs in 20 minutes. It's nothing to do with the genome. So there's a really interesting area now of understanding these non-genomic effects of steroids because we've not fully understood that. We've known for many years, for those of you who remember your sympathetic pharmacology, that of course steroids can affect uptake two of noradrenaline, and that in part may explain why they are actually very good vasoconstrictors. And of course that can contribute to why when you give steroids systemically, you can get hypertension. And then finally, as a background, we now don't use larvas or long-acting beta agonists alone. In fact, in the US for many years, they've said you shouldn't use monotherapy. They're often given in the same inhaler with the glucocorticoid steroid. And as Peter highlighted very beautifully in this particular um, review of his some time ago, they're not just complementary, one's anti-inflammatory, one's bronchodilator. There is cross-talk between the two. And I've given you one example where a glucocorticoid steroid will increase beta 2 receptor expression, and therefore there's a positive interaction and sense in giving the two in the same inhaler. And I've already said to you that there is this fantastic knowledge now about different beta agonists, different duration of action. The same is true of looking at muscular interception agonists. I just put up a couple of reviews there with my colleagues, Gabriella. Um, Matera in Naples and Maria Pizzola and Paolo Oliani, where we've reviewed this. And now, biochemically, there's a lot of cross between 
bronchodilators, muscarinic receptor antagonists on the one side, where we're blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, and beta agonists on the other side, which is selectively mimicking the sympathetic nervous system. So you've got two complementary ways of getting bronchodilation. And again, we understand at a biochemical level how this happens, but there is interaction between the two, which suggests therefore that we should be giving both classes of bronchodilator together to increase um, lung function improvement. And some experiments from uh, one of my own PhD students working a number of years ago, we took glycoperonium as a muscarinic receptor antagonist. We took indicaterol as a beta agonist. And if you take isolated human airway smooth muscle, you can determine if you look on the right hand slide here, the concentration of each drug given alone to produce a 30% change in relaxation. So it's a threshold concentration. The green bar in the middle is what you expect if you put the two together. And the yellow bar is actually what you see. So when you put the two classes of drugs together, you get greater than additive effects, and therefore there's a great benefit to putting these two complementary classes of bronchodilator together. Now this translates into the clinic. This is actually a study looked at one of the combinations of a, of a muscular interception antagonist and a beta agonist. And this is the so-called SHINE study, but there are many examples like this in the literature. So you can see here that the um, yellow squares is intercatrol as a beta agonist, measuring FEV1 on its own. We can also see glycoperonium in the orange triangles on its own. When you put the two together, you get the blue line. You get greater changes in FEV1, greater bronchodilation. And it's studies like this, based on the in vitro work I showed you and now early experimental medicine studies, that have seen us register a number of classes of drugs where we have a muscarinic receptor antagonist and a beta agonist in the same inhaler. So to come back to my earlier slide, we've got lots of beta agonists, we have lots of muscarinic receptor antagonists, but what we've seen over the last 20 years is using the beta agonist and the steroids in a single inhaler because it increases the chances of adherence. Because if you give a patient a bronchodilator alone, they love it. You give them a steroid, they'll stop taking it as soon as they feel better. You put it in the same inhaler, you'll actually then get the steroid in as well as the beta agonist. And thermoterol, particularly because it's very fast acting like salbutamol, is now being suggested to be used almost on demand, but in combination, in a fixed dose combination with a steroid. But we're also seeing combinations of bronchodilators, particularly for COPD. And we've had this, if you go and read Goodman and Gilman, the famous pharmacology textbook. Even in the 1970s, people were using salbutamol and hypotropium bromide in the same inhaler. We just have longer acting versions that we can give in the same inhaler. And then very recently, I don't know yet if you have them, Vladimir, here in the Czech Republic, but in the UK and a number of countries, we've now got triple inhalers, which is giving a muscarinic receptor antagonist a beta agonist and a steroid in the same inhaler. And so this is again to increase adherence because you don't have three separate inhalers, you can give three separate drugs. Now we'll come back to whether this is sensible, giving everybody a steroid, particularly patients with COPD, but nonetheless, they've been approved. There's very good evidence that they work. Um, and they're also quite expensive at the moment relative to other drugs. And then I just wanted to show one slide about the monoclonal antibodies. This is one of three drugs out there that are antibodies against interleukin-5. And this is one of the registration trials published from Canada. And it shows you the number of exacerbations in patients with refractory eosinophilic asthma over a 12 month period. And you can see compared to placebo, you can halve the number of exacerbations. Now, the surprising thing is that this is not associated with an improvement in lung function you don't bring it back to zero. These drugs have to be injected because they're monoclonal antibodies. In the UK, they're reserved only for severe patients in hospital. And again, they are relatively expensive compared to some of the other molecules I've talked about. But nonetheless, they have been shown to reduce hospitalization, reduce the need for steroid use, particularly oral steroid use. 
So against that backdrop, do we really need anything else? And the answer is, I think we do, because each one of these has its own problems. As I've given you the positive spin about steroids, beta agonists, but all of you know, if you give a beta agonist to people, if they give too much, they're going to get tremor. If you give them too much again, they're going to get hyperkalemia and the problem with arrhythmias, and they are not anti-inflammatory. So we've combined them with steroids, but steroids as best or as good as they are by inhalation, the safety profile is improved compared to oral systemic steroids. They will still cause side effects if they're used inappropriately. And if you look carefully in the literature, the dose response curve for steroids for efficacy is flat. The dose response curve for safety is very steep. And so just doubling the dose of a steroid doesn't necessarily give you great improvement, but it will certainly increase the chances of side effects. And part of the rationale for giving them initially with long-acting beta agonists was that actually you could give the long-acting beta agonists as a way of not having to double the dose of the steroid, but get improvement in lung function. The second thing, and I'll come back to this, is that the steroids, particularly in COPD, and I went to a seminar by a really famous physician who's coming to Czech Republic later this year, uh, Visha Bazika. When you give oral steroids acutely from exacerbation, the number of bacteria in the lung goes up. Now, if you think the bacteria causing the exacerbation, that's probably not a sensible thing to do. But what do you do instead? And so there's increasing numbers of papers that suggest that giving steroids even by inhalation increases the risk of pneumonia. As I'm going to come back to show you, giving steroids long term to COPD is really not as effective as perhaps it is in patients with asthma, and we therefore desperately need novel anti inflammatory drugs. And I just put on there reflumolast, because if you've got any uh, knowledge of reflumolast, it's a drug that has an extremely narrow therapeutic window. It causes vomiting, diarrhea. We now are concerned about suicidal tendencies. And although it's a new class of drug, it's only approved in most countries for the most severe patients on top of standard of care. So I'd argue we still need really an alternative to steroids. So what other things? I've mentioned phosphodesterases. Reflumolast targets phosphodesterase 4. But of course, we now know that there are 11 separate families of phosphodesterases. And therefore, can you actually target them selectively? in a way um, to get an anti-inflammatory effect um, without having the problems that you've got with reflumolast. Now, is this a sensible approach? The answer is theoretically yes. We target PD-5, we've got drugs like sildenafil, vardenafil. We know that they're very effective in erectile dysfunction. They're also now very effective in pulmonary hypertension. We've long known that targeting PD-3 um, can also have effects on platelet function um, and also stroke. And then more recently, the drug of Premolast, which is a PD4 inhibitor, has been approved for psoriatic arthritis as an anti-inflammatory drug. Um, again, but it is still limited, although less so than reflumolast, um, in terms of having uh, effects on the gastrointestinal tract. So what we tried to do at King's, and I put this picture up because this is one of my heroes. He should have got a Nobel Prize and hasn't. David sadly died a few years ago. And for those who don't know David, he was the person who created Glaxo. It was actually called Allen and Hanbury's. Glaxo was a New Zealand company that made milk powder. And he bought Glaxo because he wanted the powder technology so that he could introduce salbutamol. But this man and his team developed salbutamol, beclomethazone, fluticasone, salmeterol. He then also, his team discovered on dancitron and sumatriptan. And just in passing, he also discovered ranitidine. Now, if you can find me anybody on the planet who's developed so many classes of drug and the impact that's had on people's health, um, I'll buy you more than a beer because you'll have a hard time doing so. So when David stood down from Glaxo, he came to me and he said, I've found beta agonists, I've found steroids, they're very effective. Why don't we try and find a single molecule that has both activities? 
and though that's exactly what we've got on to do. So with David, Alec Oxford, who's mentioned up there, was the chemist who made this drug, RPL554. It's now got a name, it's called Enzofentrin. And we went on to develop this drug, and as I'm going to show you, we've taken it all the way through, and it's sat with the FDA at the moment. By June the 24th, they have to make a decision whether they're going to approve it or not. So we've done this as a small academic group initially. So the rationale for this is finding a drug that targets PD4, which is found in inflammatory cells. And if you inhibit that enzyme, you switch off inflammatory cells. <laughs> but it also targets PD3, which is the main enzyme in airway smooth muscle. And if you inhibit that enzyme, you get bronchodilation. So by targeting both enzymes in the same molecule, you have two functions that we require for treating both asthma and COPD. Now, we weren't the first people to think about this. We're not claiming that. Big Golden, working in Germany, developed pumafentrin, zardavrin, and tolofentrin that did exactly that. The problem is, if you note just here, the same dose you, when you inhale it, they cause bronchodilation, you've got vomiting. Because people forget that when you inhale a drug, up to 90% is swallowed. And if you have an emetic pharmacophore, it's going to end up causing side effects. And so we knew that if we found analogs that looked anything like this, even by inhalation, we were still running the risk of actually producing emesis and unwanted gastrointestinal side effects. But in principle, we knew that it also would work in the clinic. So we actually took a different approach. We found a drug that Herxt in Germany had developed for treating cardiovascular disease. It had been in 200 people, none of them vomited, none of them had diarrhea, none of them had cardiovascular side effects, so they stopped the drug because it didn't work. But it was a perfect starting point, and we made 182 analogues of this drug called Triquensin. And this is the first experiment we did where we took a piece of isolated guinea pig trachea, and if you electrically stimulate it, it contracts because it releases acetylcholine. It's a very classical method. The moment we put this drug on, this is the first ever experiment we did, it completely switches off the contraction of airway smooth muscle. So to cut a very long story short, we had to go out and raise all the money to develop this ourselves. Here are the experiments in primates. So these are primates that are allergic to a Scaris antigen. If you give them the antigen, they bronchoconstrict, the drug bronchodilates. It also is very effective against methacholine, so it was a very effective bronchodilator delayed agent. And then we also, of course, for the other arm of the pharmacology, had to show that it had anti-inflammatory activity. So we used a range of models, and this is just showing you in comparison to reflumalas, because we knew that worked, and fluticasone propionate, one of the most widely used in health steroids, in an animal model to show airway infiltration via cinephils, and you can see it was a very effective anti-inflammatory drug as well as being a bronchodilator, the same molecule. And then we raised some more money to do the toxicology so that we could do some early clinical trials. And the first of these we published back in 2013 in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. And the Lancet editor called me and said, well, how come this is a small group of people? You've done four trials is slightly unusual compared to what we normally see, but we're so excited this is a first-in-class molecule developed by an academic group. And I want to pay tribute to Dom Spina, who worked with me for more than 20 years, who died sadly from lymphoma a few years ago, and Dave Singh, some of you will know, who's a professor in Manchester um, for some of your clinical work, and my colleague, Maria Katzola in, in Italy. Because the very first patient who had this in, in Holland, in Leiden, in Adam Cohen's group, gave this profound bronchodilation. So everything we'd seen in vitro, in the primates, we got profound bronchodilation. You can see a 16% increase in FEV1. Actually, we started off with so-called healthy volunteers. We didn't have to, but we did. The first person who had it said they were healthy. The moment they inhaled this stuff, they were taken around the back into the clinic and diagnosed as having asthma. So this is not a trivial response. It was a hugely 
positive increase in FEV1. But we were aware, obviously, for patients with COPD that they have cardiovascular comorbidities very often because it was a PD3 inhibitor and because of concerns about PD3 being the heart and blood vessels. We wanted to make sure that though we were inhaling this drug, it wasn't getting into blood in any meaningful way. We wanted to make sure very early on that it also bronchitherated in patients with COPD, and more importantly, that it did so without causing any cardiovascular liability. And this is just the first set of experiments we did um, actually with Maria Cancer in Rome to show you that indeed you've got bronchodilation um, in patients with COPD. And then with Dave Singh, because doing anti-inflammatory work in man is quite difficult, David set up this really nice model in Manchester where he could take healthy volunteers, ask them to inhale lipopolysaccharide as found in bacterial cell walls. And as you can see on the right here, it produces a nice neutrophil infiltration into their sputum, which you can collect and count the inflammatory cell infiltrate. When we give the drug by inhalation at a bronchodilated dose, so this is not a different or higher dose, you get a very nice inhibition. You don't want to suppress neutrophil infiltration completely, but you get a nice inhibition of neutrophil infiltration, exactly as we'd see preclinically, suggesting that the drug indeed at the same bronchodilated dose was also anti-inflammatory. And then a bit like I showed you with the interaction between beta agonists and muscarinic receptor antagonists, we did similar experiments comparing this drug alone. So if you look particularly on this side, where we give the drug alone at the threshold concentration, salbutamol at the threshold concentration, here's the expected outcome if you combine them, and you see a greater effect when you combine the two, which was even more clear when you actually added it to a muscular interceptor antagonist. Now, the company now that's developing this has got a, a combination of glycopyrrolate and this drug in phase two clinical trials as we speak um, for COPD as a follow-up to the drug on its own. And again, what we saw in vitro translated into the clinic, this is an early phase two study showing teotropia, which is probably the most widely used muscular interceptor antagonist for treating COPD. And you can see with placebo over on the right, looking at, in this case at, at residual um, volume of air trapping, you can see this is the effect you see. The moment that you add the RPL to it, you get a greater response. And what I haven't got time to show you is that actually with teotropium, it takes 20, 30, 40 minutes to have its maximum effect. You put this drug in, it's just immediate. So we saw this positive interaction in early clinical studies in patients with COPD. And Visha Vizika, I mentioned earlier, is coming to the Czech Republic later this year. Unbeknown to me, when our initial studies came out, wrote this beautiful editorial in Arts and Inscription Medicine saying, we now eagerly await the phase two, phase three studies, because if we're right, this is the most substantial advance for some time in the management of patients with chronic airway obstruction. So we had to raise 200 million pounds to do the phase three trials, which were largely done in the United States, but elsewhere. I know some of you in this room participated in some of that. They were called Enhance 1 and Enhance 2, and over a thousand patients um, were actually looked at, giving this drug on top of standard of care um, over a number of, of uh, in a number of countries. And to cut a very long story short, both the phase threes were really positive in terms of the improvement in lung function was highly significant uh, and maintained over a period of weeks. And when you look at the subgroups of people in this, both by severity, smokers versus non-smokers, gender, age, those taking steroids, not taking steroids, this improvement was seen across the board, which was really important to us because it means that this is a placebo randomized controlled trial, but it also means that it was very effective. It wasn't going to be just useful in a subgroup of patients like some of the monotonal antibodies are. But I think one of the big surprises, or perhaps not a surprise, was the fact that if you look at the exacerbation rate in both trials, 
it is highly significantly reduced compared to the placebo. And remember, this is on top of um, standard of care. And, and this you can see on the next slide very nicely that you can see a very, very good inhibition of exacerbation over time, which of course is what we want in a drug for COPD is to keep people out of hospital, reduce their need for um, increased oral steroids. So I think this was a really positive um, endpoint, but unlike reflumalast that was approved on reduction of exacerbation, reflumalast only inhibits PD4, it's limited in its dose because of its side effects, is not a bronchodilator, you have to inhibit PD3. And any improvement in lung function you see with reflumalast comes over time, it's not acutely bronchodilator in the way this drug is. So there was nothing between the groups that suggested anything other than why the drug worked, um, including um, some of the um, other subgroup type, the type of COPD they had, um, it looked very effective. Most importantly, and there's now been nearly 2,000 people have had this drug, the incidence of diarrhea, any gastrointestinal side effects is not statistically significant against placebo. Even though it's inhaled, the swallowed bit, of course, could do it if it was emetic. And remember, we started with a drug we knew was not emetic. All the other PD4 inhibitors have started with a drug called Rolopram, which was initially developed as an antidepressant, and it's probably the most emetic compound ever found. And not surprisingly, so are the sisters, daughters, and aunties. So it has a very, very good side effect profile. Um, the other thing, although it it is a PD3 inhibitor. The plasma levels in our initial studies were so low that we had to develop an assay to find it. So it means that even if it affects PD3, it's not getting to the heart in any meaningful way. And therefore, you'll see the cardiovascular effect is, is minimal. And again, the second in ARTS2 showed very much the same sort of response. And the other thing I think is important because now regulators want to see patient reported outcomes health, um, quality of life measurements. Not only could you measure an improvement and a reduction in exacerbation, but also in the St. George's um, respiratory um, questionnaire, you could see a clear difference with the placebo um, in terms of that as well. So patients actually knew that they were um, improving. So why do I show you that? Well, we don't know what the FDA will say whether we've done enough patients that have been on triple therapy, which is now standard of care in many countries, they may ask us to go back and do more, but we definitely need new anti-inflammatory drugs for COPD. Because there are five studies like this, which we seem to have forgotten, where if you give a steroid every day on top of standard of care, and you look at the accelerated decline in lung function that we know occurs in patients with COPD, there is absolutely no benefit whatsoever. And if you were a venture capitalist and I came to you with this slide, you wouldn't give somebody a penny to use a steroid in treating COPD. With that, the potential for pneumonia risk. Now, in some of these studies, it is clear there is a reduction in exacerbation. I'm not saying steroids don't work, but we know if you sit, stop smoking in any of these studies, you actually improve that decline in lung function. So it's possible not to reverse it, but to slow it. And that's ultimately what we need to do. And part of the problem is that inhaled medicines are fantastic, as I said, because we inhale them to keep b tragus out of blood, to keep anticholinergics out of blood, to keep steroids out of blood, because if they get into blood, patients have tremor, they have problems with their bladder function, they have problems with the heart, Yet, as this slide suggests, and I give credit to Mario Katsoda because it was back in 2007 that he drew this picture, smoking does not just affect the lung. We know there's overspill of inflammation systemically. Many of the patients you see with COPD don't just have problems in their lung. They have cardiovascular disease, they have heart failure, they have all sorts of other systemic problems. So if it's pulmonologists, you're giving inhaled drugs they're never going to get in and be able to affect this in a meaningful way. So there's a great interest now of trying to find drugs that are actually systemically active. And by the way, Enzofentrin, my drug, is an inhaled drug, is not going to solve this problem either, just to be clear. I'm not claiming it's going to do this. 
But there are lots of people now recognizing that drugs that are given systemically for completely unrelated diseases actually are having benefit in patients with COPD. And I think one of the things I've been working on are heparin-like molecules, which maybe we can come back to. But a lot of these drugs that have been developed for the cardiovascular system are now being used to treat COPD, but they weren't designed for that purpose. And I think we've got to start thinking beyond just looking at the lung. And I put this up as a bit of provocation to you. I don't know if we have any cardiologists in the room, but every medical student, certainly at my institution, is taught do not give a beta blocker to people with respiratory disease. So let's just have a look at this. This is actually a study from Scotland where if we look at the penultimate line here, this is the risk factor or for few admissions into hospital due to respiratory disease, not heart disease. We have the ICS steroids, lava, long acting beta agonist, tear trochlear, triple inhaler therapy, which is considered standard of care. You add a beta blocker to it, look at the benefit you get. And I provocatively said to Vladimir over lunch and some of his colleagues, if I get COPD, with all due respect, Vladimir, I'm going to go and see a cardiologist because that to me says I want the beta blocker. And that's not actually how we're thinking. I remember when this was first presented at the European Respiratory Society, people were in uproar and said, well, you can't give beta blockers to people, you'll kill them. So let's also look at all-cause mortality. And I don't really care if it's working on the heart or somehow indirectly affecting the lung. I don't want to die. So if I can add a beta blocker, the bottom line, on top of triple therapy, why wouldn't you? Because we know these people have got very often cardiovascular comorbidities. And then let's look at this slide, because we've spent millions and millions and millions of pounds finding monoclonal antibodies that reduce steroid use that cost 100,000 euros a year. We are desperately trying to find things to reduce oral steroid use during the exacerbation. You can give it for five days, some countries seven days. Why don't you give it longer? Because you're going to get all sorts of problems you don't bother. So please take a look at this slide, because this is the oral steroid use in these people on triple therapy, then a beta blocker is added. Now I've left this slide out, but I'm sure some of you will ask questions about this. There's now a meta-analysis of 12 separate studies that support this, that you overall have a beneficial effect of beta blockers. They were never developed for, for COPD, and it brings me to the point that we've been obsessed with inhaled medicine for good reason, but actually we need all the active drugs that go after systemic inflammation as well. Now, the other one, as I said, this is a study that Vladimir and some of you in the room are very familiar with. Here is a very old drug, erdostain, which like NSL cysteine and carbocysteine, there are now three studies in the literature showing as this one did, we published a few years ago, but if we give this orally active drug on top of systemic uh, standard of care, you can see overall in all comers nearly a 20% reduction in exacerbations. Now, this is a drug that's designed for seven to 10 days as a mucolytic agent. This is giving it for a whole year. And Vladimir and his colleagues here have done a five year study now to effectively confirm this and probably got in real world um, evidence that actually supports this finding that this class of drug, or reactive, but not bronchodilators, are good at reducing exacerbation. And we looked at all sorts of other things in this study because most people when they measure exacerbations look at number, the, the rate or the number. Now, if I'm a patient and my exacerbation lasts three days or nine days, that counts as one. I wanna know, can you short my exacerbation? Can you alter the time between exacerbations? And so one of the other things that we saw is the days free from exacerbation was also greater. The time free between exacerbations, which had come out in subsequent post-hoc analysis. So again, another systemically active drug that's not a bronchodilator that shows overall benefit. And I think your study here in, um, the Czech Republic supports that completely. 
So then I want to just touch briefly on another drug that's in the gold guidelines, the guidelines for treating COPD. We've got a huge problem in the world of antimicrobial resistance. Now, Christian told me earlier about the pseudomonas situation here, which is similar to the UK, where you're running out of antibiotics that can inhibit it. This drug, azithromycin, is very effective and it's used widely in the world. And both in asthma and COPD, you can find trials in the literature where people have given it for a year because it reduces exacerbations. That's why it's in the guidelines. But at the end of that year, everyone in those studies are resistant. So if you suddenly need azithromycin acutely to treat mycobacteria, get it because you've got resistance. But why are people using it? Because it works. So one of the other projects that I'm currently heavily involved with, which is a, with a company that spun out of the University of Iceland in Reykjavik, is to develop what we call barrierides that are actually azithromycin analogues, the 15 membered azithromycin analogues, and they've been screened not to have any antimicrobial activity whatsoever because no one believes that azithromycin is working over a year because it's an antibiotic, but it's still acting with one. It's working because it's an immunomodulatory agent, and as we found in Iceland, it's able to affect epithelial barrier integrity, which is damaged in asthma, it's damaged in COPD. Now, it's been through phase one, this study, and come out the other end safe. It's currently in a phase two clinical trial in patients with COPD, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of the preclinical work to show that this drug is called EP395. We presented some of this at the ERS in Milan last year, that it blocks the infiltration of neutrophils it reduces the number of cytokines in a whole range of models, bacteria-induced inflammation, irritant, and if you've ever been to Iceland, there's a lot of sulfur dioxide around because of the volcanoes, cigarette smoke, which is a major cause of COPD, but also some of the important viruses that we know cause respiratory inflammation. And I'll just show you a little bit of data to show you here compared to azithromycin, and compared to reflumolas, the PD4 inhibitor, compared to dexamethasone steroid, there's a very nice dose-dependent inhibition of inflammatory cell infiltration with a drug that looks like azithromycin but has no antimicrobial activity. Now, if this gets through its phase two and shows some efficacy, then this could be really a game changer because this is something you can give systemically and we know azithromycin works. Now, the other thing is we know azithromycin can cause some GI problems. This drug does not affect the motilin receptor, which is what azithromycin affects to cause some gastrointestinal problems. And I think this is interesting. It doesn't affect viral load, but it does affect viral-induced inflammation, which, again, thinking about exacerbations, they're often caused as much by viruses as they are by bacteria. This is a drug potentially that can also be, we hope, able to reproduce what azithromycin does to reduce exacerbations, whatever the cause of the exacerbation. So I've given you a lot of information about where we are, some of the things I've been involved with, where we're going. But as someone from England, um, we've been having this discussion about Prague being the centre of the world here. I have to tolerate being in London, where Oxford's considered the only university worth going to. And I wanted to show you we probably made quite a lot of progress, even if you think you may not have done. So Thomas Willis was a physician in Oxford in 1684. He said, asthma is difficult, frequent breathing with a great shaking of the breast without any fever. The organs of breathing, which are the pillars of life, are shaken by this disease as if by an earthquake, which I think is a good description. But look how he treated it. You had to sleep on a chair and were given powder of millipedes and volatile salts. So I think we made some improvement there. And then recently, I had the chance to go to the Solomon Islands, which is in the Pacific near Papua New Guinea. And everywhere you go, they put up signs like this. I chose this one because it's specifically about respiratory disease. Stop spitting about places, always cover your mouth and nose when sneezing and coughing. And their approach is just keep children at home. Now, of course, if you've ever been to this part of the world, they chew beetle nuts and they have a lot of tuberculosis. You can't quite see it. The whole market is covered in red saliva 
where they chew it, spit it out. And of course, with that, you can spread all sorts of things. So I thought that was quite a nice um, answer. And then we go back not very far to this. You can actually buy Potter's Asthma Remedy and you smoke it in a pipe. And actually, this remedy we now know contains an old version of particularly what we have now of muscarinic receptor antagonists. And this was inhalation. Now, this is not back in 1684 in the UK. This is much more recently. And I can show you pictures of former presidents of the United States advertising cigarettes that have got active material to treat asthma um, and respiratory disease. So as it says on here, just put this on a plate, set it on light, cures your asthma attack. So I think we have made some progress and I'm looking to the professor of respiratory medicine here to think if he agrees with me. But I want to finally leave you with this because one of the things I do in my spare time is go around bookshops and find old books, medical books, particularly those around treatment. And this is one from 1933 called Some Thoughts on Asthma by a physician. He was a family physician in a town very close to where I grew up as a child called AJD Cameron. And I want you to listen carefully. I was amazed to find cutaneous reactions could change or disappear entirely by detoxification. I'll come back to that in a second. For that, I was bound to conclude that whatever part allergy played, it was certainly not a fundamental one. Now, we now equate very often allergy equals asthma, which I think is also wrong, but he clearly realized it was more complicated. It's a secondary condition of affairs in the syndrome, a condition which departed with adequate detoxification. So what does that include? So if you went to see this physician in 1933 in the UK, active detoxification includes colon irrigation. Read it carefully. The method of irrigation, a stand with a two gallon container can be raised or lowered as used. The container is connected by a rubber tube to one of the arms of a Y-shaped glass to the stem of which an ordinary soft esophageal tube in which an extra aperture is cut is passed into the rectum. The water at body temperature is run into the bowel, stopped before discomfort is caused and then allowed to drain off. This procedure is repeated again and again until the prescribed quantity, anything from two to eight gallons, and I don't know whether this is US or UK gallons, it doesn't matter, it's a lot, has been passed through. Just think about this, guys. The pressure employed is determined by the height of the container above the couch, and I find as a rule, a height of 12 inches is most satisfactory. It is dangerous to use too much pressure, the optimum for each patient is learned by experience. Now, my question to you is, do you want to volunteer? This is a genuine book written by a physician in the UK in 1933 as a way of treating asthma. Now, I showed this to a, a group of the, a, a science festival in Edinburgh a few years ago, and this is the final slide. The amount of material removed is sometimes staggering. And I thought people would just say, well, that's ridiculous. And this woman came up to me, she said, that's not ridiculous. I have inflammatory bowel disease. And every time I go for colon uh, clearance like this, she said, my asthma improves. Now, what is IBD? It's asthma of the gut. So maybe you got it right. But my point of showing you this is I think everything I've shown you today, we do have effective medicines. I think we can improve them. I'm doing my best to try and find things that might improve the situation because we know Adherence is a major issue with inhaled medicines, and we still desperately need an alternative to steroids as an anti-inflammatory drug, particularly for COPD, but I'd argue that we don't want to go back here um, at all. So with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and also Vladimir for the privilege of being able to come and stay with you for some time and colleagues, it's always a pleasure to come here. And I've only put some of my group up here, but really to acknowledge a number of people. The lady in the red jersey, she's been my long-serving secretary for 24 years. She's Italian. I have absolutely no idea why she stayed that long, but she still puts up with me. And then my good friend, Dom Spina, who is on the back row with the glasses on, sadly, as I said, he was one of the best pharmacologists I know of 
um, who sadly died a few years ago. So I've had lots of interesting people, both of Kings, collaborators in Vancouver and, and um, more recently in Iceland with Mike Parnham and Jennifer Cricker. And I suppose I leave you the message, I think there's a lot of hope for new drugs coming forward in this area. And just as we've done with several of these projects here, you don't have to work for Glaxo to find a new medicine. You just got to have a good idea, put it into practice. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll try and answer any questions of virology. Thank you for your time. I have the first question. Yeah. Next on the audience. Uh, my question is from uh, The gold guideline or gold strategy, the global guideline of the treatment of COPD. Yeah. And in the last version from January last year, was published that COPD is not inflammatory disorder. Yeah. Uh, I think that is a stupid statement, but this is a global initiative, and I'm only check uh, doctor. And uh, my question to you is. Uh, do you think that COPD is or is not an inflammatory disease? Second part of this question is because you present to us the anti-country, the fantastic drugs, uh, uh, where is the date of the usage according to the FDA approval? This approval will be next year or uh, after the case. Yeah. The last part is about the variolites. Uh, we sometimes have the problem with acetylmycin because because in our university, we are the pioneer in the usage of the acetomycin in the COPD. But sometimes we have the problems with the ECG, QT uh, prolongation yeah. of the law. And, and if you have the same side effect in this new one. Yeah. So I'll, I'll answer the middle one first because it's easy. So the FDA have accepted the dossier for enzofentrin. It's now under review, which means they are not asking at this stage for any new information. And they have made a public announcement that they have to make a decision on its approval, the claims it may or may not get by June the 24th of this year. Mm -hmm. So assuming it's approved, then it could be used the next day. And that's, I believe, the plan, at least in the US. It's not yet being approved for Europe. The problem personally I have, and I've not been involved in the design of these phase three trials, but I told them from the beginning I thought they were getting it wrong, is they've concentrated really on giving it in the, the all the patients in there, they're not all triple therapy. Some are on dual therapy, some are on a steroid and a larva. And so I think it really comes down to now we have triple therapy is whether the FDA will say, we want to see more data in more patients on top of triple therapy and can you still get this? So I'm still hopeful because it clearly works. The question is, how it's going to be used in conjunction with other drugs. The last question about the barrelites. So at the moment, we've not seen any cardiovascular effects um, of the uh, EP395. The, in the phase two studies, we're looking at QT very carefully because of what you've said, but I don't know yet what the answer is to that. Uh, and as I said, we also, because there are some reports in the literature where you can get hearing problems with azithromycin like other macrolides, we did a really extensive audiometry part of the phase one, which was beyond what you're required to do without any changes in, in hearing. But the QT thing, obviously, we've got to keep an eye on. But the other big thing, as I said, the gastrointestinal problems that you can have with azithromycin, this drug doesn't affect the motilin receptor, which is certainly one of the things that contributes to that. Um, so the first thing about the guidelines, you're right, the gold guidelines are international, but we all know, Vladimir, they're dominated by Americans, to a lesser extent by people from my own country, and many of the things that you use, and many, when I go around the world, to Southeast Asia, to South America, these drugs that they have available aren't in the guidelines because they can't afford them or they don't have access to them. And I think this is like with theophylline. If you use low-dose theophylline, with a plasma level less than six, you can get really good effects over time to reduce exacerbations. It's now been completely removed from the guidelines. Xanthines just don't exist. I think that's really wrong, because although it has a narrow therapeutic window, Vladimir, it has a narrow therapeutic window if you're trying to achieve 10 to 15 micrograms per mil as a bronchodilator dose, which is far too high. It's much better as a bronchoprotective agent and as we published in the Lancet in 1993, it's an anti-inflammatory agent. And Peter Barnes has done a lot of work like that. So the guidelines are guidelines. But if we come to Erdostain, 
the studies we did and you confirmed got understand the guidelines as an add-on therapy. It's not available in the US. So when they come to talk about it, they have really little understanding of some of the molecules that are there. And it's heavily influenced by major pharmaceutical companies who at the end of the day are all trying to get my inhaler in there earlier and earlier and earlier. And they're all very effective. But as Sir James Black, the Nobel Prize winner, who was my mentor, Jim said to me many years ago, he said, you haven't changed the pharmacology of asthma since the 1960s. You're still using steroids, you're still using beta agonists. All you've done is made them more potent and last longer. Now, we have got a few new classes of drugs, but fundamentally, most people with asthma and COPD are still taking the same classes of drug they were in the 1960s. You compare that to oncology, and the drugs now that are coming on specific for different types of people with different cancers, we're still in our infancy and in really understanding, I think, and where we could get further. So do I think it's an inflammatory disease? Well, you show me a single biopsy or a sputum sample from a patient for COPD that doesn't show masses of inflammatory cell infiltration. Of course it's inflammation. And I don't understand for the life of me, and Visha, who's coming to talk to you, is on the guideline committee, you should ask her, because I, I know she believes it's inflammation. I don't think inflammation is the only thing, but I do think that it's driving a lot of this. We know, as you well know, people with the anti-trypsin um, deficient never smoked a cigarette, get COPD in their 20s. So it's the balance between this excess pro-inflammatory cells and neutrophils and macrophages after exposure to oxygen pollution, whether it's tobacco smoke or air pollution. But, you know, we can normally control that with our own anti-proteases. When they go, we know. I can make the mice have emphysema tomorrow. I just take, give them excess elastase. If you knock out anything to do with antiprotease, they'll get emphysema. So that whole balance is important, but it's triggered by excess inflammation, not just in the airway, but systemically, as I said, to drive that process. And, you know, I don't need to tell you guys, half your patients have got cardiovascular disease, but the drugs that you're prescribing by inhalation can never target that. And I know some people are claiming that you can reduce exacerbations, there is some spillover, but actually they're designed not to get into blood. So if they're not getting into blood, how can they affect systemic inflammation? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it preclinically it stops neutrophils, eosinophils, and there is no suggestion that it works better in one subgroup over another, as I said, at least in the trials that have been done, but they weren't selected to be eosinophil rich, and the trials have started really before that kicked off as an idea. But I think you're, the, the idea that steroids and probably any of the monoclonals that target eosinophil should be reserved for those patients with high eosinophil numbers, I think is a sensible thing because we know that the neutrophils from smokers are very resistant to steroids in terms of anti objectives. And Peter Barnes showed that many years ago. And um, if you think I'm provocative, I heard Peter recently say, that any COPD patient who responds to a steroid has actually got asthma. Now, that's, that's his view, but I think there's a subgroup and there's an overlap between asthma and COPD as there is between COPD and bronchiectasis. So, but I don't think it's going to be an issue for endospentrin because PD4 is found in neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes, macrophages. In fact, the only cell inflammatory cell is not found in is, is mast cells, but PD3 is found in mast cells and the drug targets both. So I, I think it's not going to be that. And, and if I'm really cynical, and I've got to be careful here because this is being recorded, but 
monoclonal antibodies have been introduced into asthma, the most severe, against IL-5, against TSLP, against IgE. And there's a limit to how many asthmatics you can treat because of the cost and the route of administration. They desperately like those drugs to be used for any kind of allergic response, whether it's atopic dermatitis, rhinitis, mild to moderate asthma, but we can't afford to do that. And people frankly don't want injections if they don't have to happen. Um, when they've tried all the monoclonals to date, with the exception recently of one particular study, none of these monoclonals have done anything in patients with CAPD. In fact, one of the early studies showed that the people in the study actually one arm of it got worse. So there's a, there's a commercial push here because you have to go back the last 20 years. The pharmaceutical industry is trying to get you to believe asthma and CAPD are both inflammatory, they're both the same thing, and therefore you should use the same drugs. And by and large, that's what we've been doing for 30 years. So uh, finding mechanisms to get these drugs into patients with CAPD. Now, of course, there's a subgroup that have elevated eosin fills that's now been well defined. What you call them, and should they have steroid, I think is very sensible. But what it's saying is you shouldn't give steroids to just everybody who has the label CAPD. And if Vish is right that when you give an oral steroid and you look at the microbiome, the number of bacteria go up, what are we doing? It's crazy. And the evidence of even giving antibiotics, as you know from some of your studies here, your study looking at Erdostain over time to be able to reduce antibiotic use, because half the time you're giving antibiotics, you have no clue what bacteria are actually causing it. And is it bacteria? Is it bacteria plus viruses? And the third category, of course, we think almost nothing about the fungi. So I think we've really, if we don't challenge ourselves out of here, no one will. And other areas, meanwhile, are going off and developing huge new classes of drugs that are having serious, if you think of cystic fibrosis, what's happened with the triple ion channel modulators, is revolutionising these people, the same as oncology approaches. We're still, we've not cured a single person with asthma in my lifetime. And I'm not saying we ever will, but we are just going round and round in circles. And a lot of innovation at the major respiratory conferences are often around my sort of green inhaler, yours is blue, because the drugs in them are pretty much the same. And then it comes down to, this is not innovation, really, because it's, you know the answer, can I get 5 to 10% of the market? Well, I'm not a communist. I believe that, you know, people should make money if they spend hundreds of millions developing the drug. But we are not making the same innovation in this area because we've been obsessed with inhaled medicines, which is good in one way. You improve the therapeutic window, but not in something complex like CAPD, where there's all this other stuff going on. And if I can, if that's generally a good response, the beta blocker adds something else, why are we not giving every patient with CAPD who's got cardiovascular pain with a beta blocker? Now, I'm not going to put the Professor of Pharmacology on the spot and ask him whether in this medical school you tell people not to use beta blockers, but that's not my work. That is actual real-life prescription data from our Swabby Shell Service that if you have a diagnosis of CAPD, you go to a physician, a cardiologist, how many of them get beta blocker looking at their outcomes? Oh, sorry, I have next provocation. Uh, uh, oh, I like uh, provocation, by the way, don't worry. In the field of the uh, pharmacology of the Bronca disease, is British and Dutch hypertensives. This is the yes. story. Yes. Uh, for for students, the British say that asthma and COPD. Yes. Black and white. Yeah. And Dutch say something is between and mixed. This maybe more than uh, than uh, than the one or second. Yeah. And uh, I, my personal experience, uh, we are looking for patient for astigmatic study. This bubbling treatment uh, for COPD. Yeah. And we review 300 patients from from my. COPD clinic, my yeah. long-term outpatients, and almost all have some features of the asthma. Yes. And I'm confusing because changing of the climate, changing of the politics, Trump and Biden, all is changing. And now in my COPD clinic, 
almost all patients have some mixed disease yeah. with some features of the atrophy, uh, positivity of the bronco, uh, provocation chest or bronco attachment. Uh, all is something between. And my history or my my my, my view is that maybe we have more more patients with a mixed disease yeah. than expected. Yeah. More than there no, are. I, I think it's not black and white. I think you're absolutely right. And, and I, I'd also say, I mean, because you're right, Dirkie Postma in Holland, she spent her entire career saying that the Dutch hypothesis and the rest of us have got it wrong. But I'd still argue, um, Vladimir, who in their right mind in the last 50 years defined chronic bronchitis and emphysema under the same label? Because some people get chronic bronchitis and that's it. Some people get it regularly and will go on to get emphysema. But smoking, you can die of lung cancer, you can die of cardiovascular disease. We concentrated just on the, the lung side of it. So the real problem is the syndrome, effectively, it isn't just a single you have it or you haven't. I think you're absolutely right. There's overlap. And it's a bit like phenotyping going on now in oncology and elsewhere. We've, we've tried to say, let's bring in all comers. If you've got asthma or COPD, you all need and it helps steroid in the beach one out to be dragons. And I'll remind those of you in the room who are probably not old enough to remember this, the largest fine in history against a pharmaceutical company is against Glaxo when they made claims about serotype, the long active beach dragons with some extra fluticasone in the US, it was a useful treatment for COPD. Because whilst now it's approved, at the time it wasn't, and they fined them several billion dollars for marketing a drug because they assumed and trying to get across to the rest of the world that asthma and COPD are the same thing, and they clearly aren't. But yes, there's likely to be overlap. And we know from Klaus Rabe's work, there's overlap with asthma. There's clearly, as we know from um, James Chalmers, there's overlap with bronchiectasis. So it, it's probably a syndrome, and you're at some point on this, and if you happen to be smoking a lot, or you're born with small lungs and you develop slightly differently, as other people have suggested. But, but again, at the moment, you look at the slide in the guidelines, we're using the same pharmacology independently of whether or not any of these phenotypes exist. And the attempt now to get some of the monoclonals targeting eosinophils in comes off the back, as you know, a lot of people do not, even in your own recent study, whether you're on a steroid or not, made absolutely no difference. So why are we using them in everybody? It's identifying that people can respond. And to your question, is those with the eosinophils, because we know from asthma, they are extremely effective drugs at reducing eosinophil infiltration. They are really poor drugs at stopping neutrophil activation, particularly in neutrophils that have been exposed to oxidant pollution. That is in the literature in spades. So it's provocative, but I agree with you. Okay. Uh because the time is running. Now uh, we are in the second part of your stay here, and we are gradually uh, is going uh, from the lecture to the discussion with the friendly professor. Meet the friendly professor. And well, I hope I'm friendly. friendly. <laughs> My students tell me sometimes, Vladimir, that I I intimidate them. I'm actually the friendliest, most open person you can come and talk to any time. As I said when we did one of these meet the professors the last time I was here, this is the time to ask any question I ever stupid, because if I can't answer it, I'll try and find someone who can. About really anything that when you're working as a, as a clinical academic or research scientist, that there's a lot of things you can do without having lots of money. You just need a good idea and you need to focus. And that's, that's the one thing you've got in your favour is patience in front of you. And, and as we talked about at lunchtime, you have all lots of information. It's about asking the right questions of the data. You're not all going to develop a new class of drug. Very few people do. I've been very fortunate because that's what I've spent my career. That's always interested me. I've worked in industry and I thought, well, I can do this. And I've had some good mentors. But there are lots of things you can really answer. And to come back to the question at the back, you've got lots of patients. They have different levels of eosinophilia. So do a real world study. Is it only the people that have got the elevated eosinophils that do well on it? Because if they do do well on it and the others don't, 
Why do you need the expensive microantibody? That's a, you don't need a lot of money to do that. It's just it's observational about the patients you've got, the data you've got. And if Vish is right, that every single person with COPD in the UK is given a rescue pack to take home. And if they get into trouble, they have prednisone, they have an antibiotic, they're told what to do. But if you're giving the very drug to them, apart from the steroidal side effects when you give them, it's a if you really are increasing bacterial numbers in the lung, what are we doing that for? Should we not be trying to find alternatives to reduce exacerbations? So our NHS, as I think I mentioned at lunchtime, we're now, with Tom Wilkinson and Dave Singh, we've got funding, we hope, coming from our the research arm of our NHS to look for how do you best treat acute exacerbations. And I'm chairing an advisory group selecting candidates to go into that study. So you have a platform study across 30 hospitals to then put in to say, can we find other ways of treating acute exacerbations? Now it's going to take time to, to get that data out, but we're doing it because it's a recognition that we don't know the answer and the answer at the moment is not ideal. Maybe you disagree with me, maybe you think it's okay we increase bacterial. As you said earlier, Christian, we'll just take an antibiotic. But why take an antibiotic if you don't know what bacteria are going off? You may shift the whole thing. And anyway, even with nebulized antibiotics like Tobramycin, these people have mucus plugs, they have biofilms. Finding the paper that says the drug gets anywhere near the bacteria that you need to deal with. Because we don't know. We have almost no understanding about what happens, the fate of drugs by inhalation. There are, I think, three or four studies in the literature with inhaled salbutamol that's been PET labeled or radioactively labeled, and you put something in front of a camera camera and you get some idea of where it might go. We don't know. And most of it gets no more than a second of conducting airway. So how does it run for the eight? So there's plenty of things to keep you busy. And then to my mind, the risk